I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Thomas O'Neill White. We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is What's Next. A dedicated hour to have important conversations about the issues facing the marginalized and underrepresented communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truth. What's Next continues our mission to discuss race, equity, and the common concerns of Buffalo's East Side and beyond. In the suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. Hello, you're listening to What's Next on WBFO. I'm Holly Kirkpatrick, and I'm excited to be here with Buffalo's brand new poet laureate, Itina Fareed Cook. Itina's creative endeavors are not limited to poetry, however. She's also an artist, musician, educator, and storyteller. And as founder of media arts company Get Focus Productions, she's a familiar face on the Buffalo art scene where she collaborates with other artists to help tell their stories. In her life as a musician, she goes under the stage name of AI The Anomaly, and she's traveled all over the country performing tracks from her four studio albums and EP. She was born and raised on Buffalo's east side, and she's proud of her roots. One of her best known songs is even named after the area, but she had a tough start in life. When she was 14 months old, Itina and her two siblings were placed in foster care. Then when she was three, she lost her mother to substance abuse. On Becoming Buffalo's Poet Laureate, she says, I get to take all of these experiences just like paint and I'll get to paint the canvas. And my hope is that you all felt something, but not only felt something, but chose to do something about how you felt. Itina Fareed Cook, welcome back to What's Next. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be back with you. Yeah, so <laughs> I know not typically you're doing this, but um, I'm, I'm excited to sit down with you. I know we talked before in the past. so Yeah, it's so. great for you to be here. We have spoken before. Um, I've spoken to you in your capacity as a musician, AI yes. The Anomaly, and keen listeners will also know that you've been on this show before. What's yes. next? Uh, but not as the Poet Laureate. So congratulations on your new role. Thank you so much. Um, and we're speaking just a few days after you were announced as the Poet Laureate. Uh, let's run through briefly what it involves. It's a position that's appointed by the mayor. It lasts until the end of the year with the option to continue on for one more year after that. It's an unpaid position. It's voluntary. Uh, and you can be commissioned to write poems, it says, or other tributes that reference the city of Buffalo. So, Itina, you're just the second person in this position. How do you hope to put your stamp on it? You know what? Like with anything that I do... My mission is to ignite thought and expand perspectives. And so in this capacity, I'm going to utilize literary arts in order to do that. And I really hope to also really just put a stamp on the fact that there's so much power in the creative arts, like all of who I am. And so um, I really want to leave that stamp uh, within the city of Buffalo, that there's power in the creative arts no matter where you come from. So this is a question in a similar vein, but I think it's slightly different. So that's what stamp you want to put on it. Is there anything in particular you'd like to achieve? Any kind of event that you want to perform at? Anything that you want to leave legacy wise? You know what? Like it, you've only just started and I'm asking you what you want your legacy I know, to be. I know, I know. it's a lot of pressure. And, and to be honest, that that is that is what it is you know ignite thought and expand perspectives that's what my mission is overall in life and so i'll utilize these skills to do that um i'd say i just want to make sure that whenever i'm speaking i'm speaking from my heart from my experiences and i'm being careful to find a way to position it so at least the majority of people can understand what is being said as it relates to whatever the city is going through or whatever's on the timeline or whatever the case is. There's not really a particular event, if you will. Oh, you know what? Actually, I'd love to speak t within the space of foster care. Mm -hmm. And I think someone should speak and elevate that space to just showcase to the next generation or even those who are foster alumni, you know, and, you know, who have gone through the system, but who have 
pushed past those statistics and were able to make something of themselves, but they don't always see someone in certain capacities. I'd love to, you know, use my words, use my gifts, skills, talents, or what have you to showcase, like, here's what you can do and speak to that demographic as well. So what was the process like in becoming the Poet Laureate? How did you find out? I think overall, anytime you are placed in a position, I think there's a lot of vetting (laughs) before they reach out or what have you. And um, I'm pretty sure there was a lot of research, which I don't know if you have to do a lot. You know, I've been in a lot of spaces. Um, I've seen the mayor in particular in many spaces where I've spoke. um, And uh, I'd say that perhaps that was the initiation of let's reach out and um, find out if there's interest. And then once, you know, I went through that process and expressing my interest, we went through a process of showcasing my credentials and, you know, going through the process of what do I foresee with this space and this role and um, how do I look, you know, to kind of make it make it your own. Um, We should mention, I've already said, but it is an unpaid position. There will still be some people out there, though, who think a city ordained poet? Really? (laughs) Do we really need that? What would your response be to that kind of attitude? I mean, of course, of course you need something that will uplift the community in a creative way. There's something about the creative writing process and the creatives in general Art is a language, Mm. and every medium is a different dialect. And I truly believe that within the art space, there's this ability, there's this ability to touch a wide range of individuals, because you can you can utilize whether it's visual arts, theater, you know, whether it's uh, digital media, whether it's liter literature or what have you. It has the potential to to touch something within the emotions it's emotive and so because of that a lot of times in these circumstances where there's things happening in this city and there's events and things like that poetry has the power to open up the ears to get them ready for something regard you know whatever that may be whatever the instance is the event or whatever is happening I feel like it opens up our ears no matter where we're from, no matter what the backgrounds are, that is important. You know, I think that that can be impactful and powerful. I know that it's something that's been impactful and powerful in your life. Yes. Um, Can you just explain a little bit about how you came to be so creative? You know, you're a musician, you're an artist, you're a videographer. What led to, to that for you? I think pain became potential for me. Um, as you mentioned, my past uh, coming up in the foster care system, uh, losing my mother, my beautiful, creative, intelligent mother who had voids, just like sometimes we do as humans, um, losing her to substance abuse and to be in a foster home that I had this woman, you know, my foster mother at that time, who knew that because of the odds that were against us and because of the labels like failure to thrive, I was diagnosed as emotionally handicapped. She knew I'm going to have to get these children involved in the community in some capacity. And what I draw was drawn to was creatives, you know, creatives, creative arts started off at church, just singing in the choir, you know, uh, memorizing, Um, scriptures and things like that and doing Easter plays and it went from there to be infused with that and then going to performing arts being a graduate there and being told I would be a failure to thrive and emotionally handicapped there's this sense of you don't have a voice where the creative arts allowed me to have a voice it's just a different way you know I get to be free within poet poetry you know I get to be free within photography or what have you so yeah I I um I'd say it's pretty extensive (laughs) you know I started very young and um which is why I feel like the arts are important yeah and 
you you're very open. I mean, we're talking right now about mm. those those tumultuous kind of early years, if you like. Yeah. Um, and you seem to be really willing to put this part of yourself out there. And it must be a part that's quite hard to talk about at times. So why is it so important for you to share those experiences or that part of you? Because it's who I am. You know, how can you get a full sense of someone? And I'm not saying this is something that's easy. Mm -hmm. I, I think that as human beings, and this is what I teach to young young people, the things we go through become our gold. You know, I grew up being told that the East Side is this and that, and there was a lot of negativity, but I lived there. How do you tell a child that where they live and where they grow and develop is are, are these negative instances or what have you? And I see it in a different perspective. So it's important for me to say I'm from the East Side it's important for me to say I'm a foster care, I was in foster care. It's important for me to say that, you know, these different things that I come from so that those that may feel as though they're not worthy or they don't have value because they come from the same space, their ears can be opened, their hearts can be opened to say, you know what, maybe I can, you know, controlling and and taking ownership of your story and not being afraid I think created this freedom in me that um I'm resilient you know I'm an open book you know what I mean and there's a level of confidence that I carry that I think is a tr <laughs> you know people are attracted to that and yeah. when they're attracted I want to give what else can I give you you know hope truth you know, everything that you're saying is, I mean, I'm sitting here is really positive and it's wonderful to hear. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I can, I feel that, do you still kind of brush against that notion that the East Side is a place where some people might not be so proud to come from? You seem to kind of brush against that. There's a friction there. Um, you're talking about that resilience. Like, why, why, should, I, why should I be, um, you know, afraid to say that that's where I'm from? Right. I mean, why? Why should I? I come from the east side, the side of the city that gave me hope. Mm. I think anywhere the, where there's humans, like we're, we have flaws, you know? We have experiences that have shaped our perceptions and perspectives. And through that, we're, we're just trying to live, you know? We're trying to live the best that we can with flaws and all yes there's flaws on the east side but there's also flaws on the south side mm -hmm. and the west side and the mm -hmm. north side and anywhere else you go you know why because we're human beings trying the best that we can and so yeah I'd, i brush against that notion of you know even i said it in my songs you know talk about how people you know drive fast past the east side because they're afraid but i think with the fear in that discomfort becomes this almost this comfortability with discomfort unfortunately and they push past and you never get to experience and so that's what I'm trying to do like I want people to experience the fact that me very intentional very driven very resilient very confident very educated I come from the east side you know it's tough maybe sometimes violent, but I also come from places where neighbors looked out for each other, you know? I come from a place where when I walked outside, you know, there was Miss Sarah down the street, Miss Jones that always said hello. If I was doing something wrong, they would come and check on me and tell my mom. That was community for me. So you can't, you can't just focus on the negative, so much positive too. This is a great reason to flip to talk about the fact that you are a musician, mm -hmm. you use the name AI, the anomaly, you have, in my opinion, probably your catchiest tune is called East Side. It's to me, it's a huge celebration of the East Side and the fact that you're mm -hmm. from there as well. Who that little lady from the East Side? AI, the anomaly. Who that little lady from the East Side? AI, I'm going all in, all in. Who that little lady from the East Side? 716 Nickel City where I come from Who that little lady from the 
on the east side. Yeah. AI, I'm going all in, all in. Ain't ready for this lyrical lion do you like performing that song? It seems to go down well when you do it live. Oh my goodness, yes. I, you know, I perform all over, but I think one of the most funniest situations or the most interesting situations was when I was on stage in California, all the mm-hmm. way in the West. I said, who that little lady from the... Everyone said, Eastside. So it was just, it's interesting. Like, um, I, I feel like it's it's a confidence to 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 say you know, and to, to uplift that. And like I said, I, w- I want people who come from that space to feel like, yeah, yeah, flaws and all, whatever the case is, I come, this is where I come from, you know? And let's get into a little bit about your process. So here again, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. my experience of you is in your life as a musician. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm speaking with that, but feel free to go in whatever direction. Of course. Um, and I know from interviewing before that when you are working on your lyrics in the studio that I've been to, mm-hmm. um, you welcomed me there. You work in what seemed to me a very zen way. Yeah, It was dark. There was a darkened booth. Mm-hmm. There was a curtain mm-hmm. there so no one can see you as you're um, flowing, I, mm-hmm. I believe the term is. Um, can, you, can you explain your process a little bit to those who aren't so familiar? So writing to me is my remedy. Mm -hmm. It's my medicine. It's a very sacred place. It started off as that, you know, I was given a pen. A counselor said, write down your emotions. And and I fell into that sanctitude, if you will. And so I carried that throughout and I always wanted to protect it. But yes, like entering into that space, it's, it's magnificent when you're able to cultivate and create a sense to where you can feel free and safe. And the studio that we were at is Carolina Blue. That's my audio engineer. Mm-hmm. He's been he has been able to create that space and that vibe for me. And we work really well together. And and you know he understands where I'm coming from when it comes to that. But yeah, I then take a moment to think about all that is happening around me, and I get to utilize words and shape lyrics with the hope to share it so everyone else can feel something, ignite thought, expand perspectives. So yeah, I I definitely love music, but rap is rhythm and poetry. You know, I started off as a writer. I went into poetry. I did a lot when it came to that. I love the art of writing. I love the journey it takes you on, Um, how you can nestle words in a way how you can, you know, piece together things to say in so many different ways. You know how they say a thousand words, a picture is worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. So many words you could put together to formulate pictures, you know. And it's the most safest place and the most comfortable place for me. I feel like my first language is poetry. (laughs) So when you go, in this case, in the studio, do you already have an idea of what you're going to write or does it do you take the time and that space for something Mm -hmm. to come to you almost? Yeah, it depends. So in some cases, I'm prepared to go into the studio and record whatever the song, you know, whatever it is that we need in order to get a project done. A lot of times I may go in and I need to release Mm -hmm. and it's freestyle, you know, and I'm just saying the things that I need to say. And whatever I've carried throughout the days, the weeks, the months, whatever I've seen, I'm responding to those things through, you know, music. And um, so, yeah, it depends on the circumstance. Uh, the most freest situation is when I'm going in there and I'm I'm just saying what comes from my heart um, based off of whatever is happening within my life or the surrounding, you know, space that I'm in. So you've already touched on this a little bit. So are these two things I'm talking specifically about writing lyrics for your your raps and Mm -hmm. the poems, are they the same thing to you? Or is there a moment where you know, well, actually, this is I don't think this is a song. I think this is a poem. Yeah, sometimes that does happen. The thing the thing about music. There are limitations. You're limited within the rhythm. Now, depending on your skill set, you're able to fight against the rhythm. I don't even want to say fight. You're able to tango with the rhythm 
in different ways. If you have an understanding of rhythmical patterns and cadences and things like that, there's ways in which you can say what you need to say, you know, within that, you know, beats per measure, if you will. But with poetry, there's this freedom. There is not that limitation of beats per measure. So you're able to elongate ideas, you know, you're able to you know, stay on a topic and really expand a metaphor, you know, over some time. And sometimes poetry can go for an extended period of time. So, yeah, they're definitely different to me. But the approach is still the same. Heart first, human first. Great. Well, I know that you are (laughs) a great guest because you've bought a poem to read. Yes. And I'm really excited to hear it. I'm excited to know what it's about if you feel that it would have been constricted by music, okay, in some way, or maybe there were some boundaries there. So if you would mind, if you wouldn't mind, sorry, Mm -hmm. reading whenever you're ready, I think we'd all be excited to hear. Yeah, yeah. So actually this piece, and I may condense it, you know, um, this piece is a piece that I actually wrote sometime around 2009. This is one of the first pieces that I delivered at City Hall, Mm -hmm. was requested to come speak on a couple of occasions. And for their day of service during that time, I came to speak about service. And so uh, this this is what I felt. When a seed is planted deep into the ground, the sun kisses the earth and the rain waters the soil, and after days, weeks, months, years, a tree emerges with roots that run deep, and its branches stretch with buds that bear fruit. This is nourishment. This is oxygen. This is service. Service is nature's natural intention. At times, it's an unconscious duty. However, what makes service great is its motivation. Hence those great leaders before us, Dr. King, Sojourner Truth, Mary McLeod Bethune, Harriet Tubman, Malcolm X, Fred Hampton, Huey Newton, Jesus Christ. Their intention was to ignite change, a change much needed. And with this intent, service was rendered and lives were changed. The same intent is planted deep within us, growing and anxious to bear fruit. Fruit for those in need of love, fruit for those in need of shelter, protection, trust, for those in need of time, and for those in need of our ears. Some fear in the thought that you must be great in order to serve. Even the ants in the crevices of the earth serve. Each and every one of you can serve as parents serve your children through listening to them. Though we work hard and long hours to find time to encourage them, develop the patience to endure the difficulties that you will face. Us parents know that parenthood is the toughest hood to stroll through. A lifelong, beautiful, chaotic journey. Our children hold them accountable when it's necessary and advocate for them when they cannot. Know where they are and know who they are with. As teachers, serve your students with love and loyalty, though you may have 20, 25, or 30 youth, which is wild in one classroom, but yet serve them with education, with kindness, be fun, fair, and firm. Many of them are rough around the edges, and yet they are human, so treat them as such. Understand that many of these youth come from broken homes and go to bed hungry, and some who have beautiful homes, and their parents are present but not present, and some who have no homes, some who have lost loved ones or are dealing with uncomfortable family issues, and don't assume you know who. Disparity and poverty doesn't discriminate, so serve with compassion regardless. Administrations, serve your teachers with respect. Be balanced and just. Don't forget their that your teachers are on the front lines. So fight for them, support them, actively listen. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Spend a day in their classroom, not just to observe, but to serve. Politicians, community leaders, serve us not with the intent to make decisions that make you look good, but by making the decisions for the good of the people. Service is wanting the best, not only for yourselves, but for all of us, community. Service is contagious, it's motivating, it's loving, it's thinking outside of the box, creating ideas that would touch the lives of everyone, all people, humans, us, citizens, serving your neighbors with kindness, humility, supporting one another, not only through our words, but also through our actions, through our hearts, not only in the eyes of the public, but in the privacy of our homes. In all we do, we should serve. 
from the first student bus drivers transporting our youth to our garbage men, our snow parlors, our mailmen, doctors, police officers, dentists, grocery store workers, Uber drivers, business owners, serve your employees. It's not about just doing your job. It's how you do your job. Servicing sonnets within our body language. It pours through our tone. It's nestled within our voices. Don't forget that we are all human in need of service and service not just for one day, but for every single day, knowing that service is forever. So I charge you all to forever serve. Itina Farid Cook reading her poem there. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So this is What's Next on WBFO. I'm Holly Kirkpatrick, and today we're joined by Buffalo's new poet laureate, Itina Farid Cook. Your poem on service there, I know that your predecessor, Gillian Hainsworth, she called the, the role of poet laureate a service. It Would is. you agree? I absolutely call it a service as well. I think that... Um, Sometimes, you know, it's it's placed in this category where they say it's unpaid, it's volunteership and things like that. But yes, it's service, serving through the creative arts. And you you mentioned it there. And I know from talking to you before and I know from following you on social media, listening to your lyrics and your songs, mm -hmm. that your faith, you, you're a Christian, your faith is obviously a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. How does it manifest itself not only in your life, but also in your work? You know, my faith is based on a foundation of loving your neighbor as yourself, seeking first to understand and to be understood, um, actively listening, um, being slow to anger, quick to speak, not quick to speak, but <laughs> slow to speak. And so it's, it's love, agape. It's unconditional. Regardless of where you come from, what your background is, or what, what it is that you choose, I can love with action. And so that's the, the framework, that's the, the, the foundation of who I am, you know, within my faith. And I think that if I might say so myself, and I hope, I hope that this is very clear to other people, that manifests through what I say and what I do. I'm not perfect. I may have flaws. No, not I may, I do have flaws. But one thing for sure, I'm striving towards perfection, and that is a lifetime striving and journey. And um, I hope that that showcases in everything that I do. You know, I just want to serve through love, you know. Another thing that I see as being part of your life and your work is your family. Oh, yeah. Again, very present on social media. Uh, your kids are in your music videos sometimes. <laughs> is that a conscious choice to involve them in, in this life, this creative world? Of course it is. Of course it is. My two little beautiful creative beings, uh, Isaac and Eilina, and then my husband, um, 13 years, uh, Joshua Cook. My family is my foundation, and I think it's the key to a lot of things within life. And so I think it's a, it's very important to me to showcase. Um, coming from my background and being feeling this displacement, not really having my blood relatives as much as I would want wanted to, it gave me a sense of wanting and longing for family. So man, my family is my backbone, you know. They're the ones that I go home to when I get to be <laughs> 100%, <laughs> you know, Idina. And so, yeah, it's very intentional to have them part of everything that I do. And having their mommy a poet laureate, that's a really oh official goodness. title, right? Everybody's excited. My daughter uh, said, she asked me, Mom, is someone going to call you to be the president of the United States? Because <laughs> she was trying to figure it out, like, what is this? What is going on? And, you know, her friends at school were saying they saw me on TV. Well, they say this a lot. And uh, she she thought I was going to become the president. So, wow. <laughs> Watch this space. Um, and we, we, you've, we've been speaking a lot about self-expression yeah. with mm -hmm. this. Um, and in your role as poet laureate, what, what if the powers that be don't like what you have to express? You know, would that play a part in what you create or decide? It might it curtail what you decide to express if you're worrying how it might be received? That's such a great great question you know I think that as an artist well first and foremost as a human being within 
the society that has created freedom of speech mm-hmm. um, and to be able to have the freedom within my artistry to present it as I see fit. I think that that has been respected, you know, by those who have made the choice to place me in this position. I think that there are going to be times where, you know, I may say something that doesn't sit right with people. And I understand that. And that's their right to have their opinions and perceptions or what have you. But I think that's the point. I think sometimes, you know, maybe I may I may say some things that are uncomfortable, but I have experiences and to know that uncomfortability drives drives us towards some type of change that's what I hope you know there may there may be people that uh may not like what I say (laughs) um due to just not understanding or like I said perception or perspective but I'm okay with that and I think I'm I'm the type of person I'd love to have an open discussion because then I can seek first to understand than to be understood. Is that something that's, that's ever happened to you before where people have received something that you've had to say in a way that, you know, they didn't like? Have you, have you ever felt that? Because to me, mm-hmm. following you on social, it seems you know, everything's very positive, mm-hmm. actually. It doesn't seem to me that you get any real uh, push pushback. Mm-hmm. Is that, that seems a good thing. Yeah, I would, I would say so in some, some degree. This is the thing, the skill of writing before I put anything out, I'm, I want to be thoughtful. My, my first position is, am I saying something that's going to help? You know, how do you position what you're going to say so that it helps, not harms? Now, sometimes there's things that need to be said that feels like it hurts. Like, wait, I, what, what, what happened? What's going on? But having that open discussion. Now, I would say, yes, there have been many times or people <laughs> were not happy with what I said. This is where I would segue with like an education, mm-hmm. you know, working with students. And I, I say, hey, I need you to sit down right now. <laughs> you know, having classroom management and things like that. Or you are creating conflict within this classroom or within this creative arts workshop. And of course, they don't, they don't like what I'm saying. But it's all about how do I help you realize the purpose of what I'm saying, you know, let's let's step back and actively listen. This is what I, I teach young people actively listen. You have to have restraint within yourself to really seek. What are you saying? Is it purposeful? And if you don't agree, that's OK. That's fine. But listen and then let's exchange and be kind and respectful. And a lot of students respect that. They understand and they get back to work and then they create some beautiful art pieces and poetic pieces in the class. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your role as an educator. Yeah. So what exactly is it that you do in that world and environment? I know you've been involved in education for quite some time. Yes. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm really excited to talk about it because I, I really love educating um, in different capacities. It's, it's like what I've, what I've gained, especially through the creative arts. Um, so in many different capacities. So I've worked with many different nonprofit organizations and youth development. I knew that's what I wanted to do because of my circumstances. And so I work with Community Action Organization, Heart Foundation, Young Audiences, who is now Arts Partners for Learning. Um, and as a teaching artist, but also as one who created programs, uh, researched grants in order to fund programs that will help young people understand their potential, but also raise their reading skills and, under, you know, ex- expose them to different opportunities through the creative arts. And so um, whether it's been in roles where you're an ad- administrator or roles where you're one-on-one with students or having, uh, you know, hundreds of students in a summer camp. And so I've taught in those ways, but I've also developed curriculums in order to teach literary arts to students. And then I teach on higher education. I was an adjunct professor at Buffalo State University. And then I also go to colleges and teach. Right now we're partnered with Villa Maria and I taught and I 
teaching students in the digital media communications department how to take what they're learning in the class and apply it to practical spaces. And so they're working with us on the project that we're doing, the Tales from the Porch, and they're capturing content. They're um, working with the cameras behind the scenes, developing questions, um, working with our company and going into different spaces and just, you know, being able to be exposed to these different opportunities. And Tales from the Porch is? Tales from the Porch, I'm sorry. Tales from the Porch is an opportunity to amplify the voices within the community. And that's through the creative arts. So photography, film, just a bunch of different mediums. And we collaborate with a lot of creatives in order to do that. And like I said, these students are infused in it. And the the process of Get Focus Productions has always been about capturing, teaching, and giving back. Mm -hmm. That give back piece. How are we pulling the next generation of creatives into the process so that they can foresee this is something that I can actually live out. I'm compelled by the creative arts. Not sure how I'm going to make this happen, but I'm getting this involvement to see myself in this position. Okay, well, you're making it really clear that not only do you want to inspire but you want to inspire people to take action, to do, to oh, create. Oh, of course. Well, let's start right here. Let's do it. So um, what's a good starting point for people? They're listening. They're saying, oh, I heard that poem. It was great. I'm inspired. What if people want to pick up a, a pen and write a poem? What should they, how should they begin? What should they be thinking of? I would say, first and foremost, just start writing and let it flow. Then if you want to take it further, I'd say you have to identify the why. Like I always talk about this, you know, the why behind who you are and what you do. That is going to guide your pen, you know, and then you're, you're going to have to educate yourself. You need to educate yourself. Yes, you can write freely and things like that, but there's takes education and skill to take words and mesh them together so that it makes sense. And it's impactful and you're getting us somewhere with your words. It should be a train. It should be a journey to get us to a call to action. What are we doing? So I would, I would say start there, you know. Any limitations? Any, you know, if try, I, I, I will fully disclose here. I used to be a teacher before mm -hmm. this as well. <laughs> so any time limits? Sometimes a time limit can really inspire people. Oh, you know, yeah. Do what you can in 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. I would say like five minutes. This is a every, workshop right now. Oh, okay. I'd say <laughs> every day for five minutes, write and don't stop. Now, now let me tell you something. <laughs> five minutes is going to feel like a long time. So maybe you start with two. Okay. The key thing is you have to keep writing. One of the problems is that we second guess, we pull back, we're unsure, we think that we're not worth it. And we stop and we move forward. The key thing is keep going, don't stop, then look back at it. And then for the next two minutes, how do you update what you said? And then for the next two minutes, you know, work on expanding the thought. Well, this is public media and you're providing a public service right now. This is what's <laughs> next on WBFO. I'm Holly Kirkpatrick and we're talking with Itina Farid Cook, Buffalo's new poet laureate. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, now, I've noticed, I've, I've read the Common Council resolution on your role, and I've seen that you don't just have to write poems if you don't want to, apparently. It says poems, prose, or other tributes about the city of Buffalo. Now, it seems to me that you're really well placed to do the and other section oh, of you that. Know it. <laughs> you know it. Yes, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I think it's, I think it's a matter of the circumstances, right? What does it call for me to do? Do I feel a lot of what I write, it's poetic in nature, but it's, it's really, it's creative writing, you know? Um, it's the writing process. Um, I mean, I would love to, to, there's several songs that I've written about my city. Maybe it's a song, I don't know, or a speech or what have you. But um, I think for the most part, being able to be creative through the process is the key. Itina Farid Cook, Buffalo's new Poet Laureate, thank you very much for joining us on What's Next today. Thank you so much for having me. We'll be back with more What's Next after this.
This is the Buffalo Toronto Public Media History Bite, bringing you a peek into significant historical events for the week of March 18th through March 24th. I'm your host, Tom Barich. On March 18th, 1850, Henry Wells, John Butterfield, and William Fargo conducted a business meeting at the Mansion House Hotel on Delaware Avenue in Buffalo. The purpose of the meeting was to establish a credit system for the American people that businesses and consumers could agree on. Upon the success of that meeting, the company was founded and is now known as American Express. The western New York towns of Cheektowaga, Hamburg, and Eden were all established on March 20th, 1812. And legendary magician and escape artist Harry Houdini gave a performance at Shea's Auditorium on March 23rd, 1908. You've been listening to the Buffalo Toronto Public Media History Bite. Discover more stories about Western New York's past on the Buffalo History Museum's website. Learn more at buffalohistory.org. For Buffalo Toronto Public Media, I'm Tom Barich. Did you know that WNED PBS is always working on great new local shows for you to watch? Documentaries like Kleinhand's Gift to Buffalo, which tells the story of Buffalo's music hall. The hall is very intimate, and that intimacy makes everyone who comes in here feel a part of our family. Fun and educational series like Compact Science. Believe it or not, peppers are technically fruits. And Shakespeare's greatest hits featuring some of his best-known soliloquies and monologues. We are such stuff as dreams are made of. You can watch them all on our website at wned.org slash local shows. While you're there, check out the show pages and many websites for additional content such as bonus features, photo galleries, and lesson plans. Find it all at wned.org slash local shows. You're listening to What's Next, our place to discuss the important issues of our communities of Western New York and Southern Ontario. We want to hear from you. Click on the Talk to Us option in the WBFO app, and we will work to get your questions or comments on the air. Do you have a story or concern that we should be addressing? Email us using what's next at wbfo.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. Welcome back to What's Next. Following our discussion with Itina Farid Cook, we wanted to revisit another conversation about the role of Buffalo's Poet Laureate. In January, Jay Moran sat down with Jillian Hainsworth, who originated the position and worked with the Common Council to help establish it. She spoke about the origin of the role, as well as her hopes for her successors. I'm glad that the role has taken a life of its own, and I'm glad that I don't have to be in it for it to be sustainable, because if that's how it was created, it wouldn't last very long. Right. <laughs> and it was created to be bigger than just me. You know, I know people will think of me when they think of the role itself, but it's bigger than me. So it's time for, you know, a new voice to step in and and make it their own. That's a, a very gracious uh, approach for sure. At the same time, though, as we go back, and one of the reasons we wanted to have you in here is, is just for that, a chance to maybe reflect on what obviously has been a, a very eventful time, not only for you in your personal and professional life, but also here in the city of Buffalo. Um, but if we can just maybe just step back to that drive that you had, because you, this mm-hmm. is really pretty much you that pushed this forward, the, the idea of having a poet laureate in Buffalo. What was your motivation? Um, honestly, I was really starting to find my voice in poetry and starting to create my identity here as someone who uses the art to, to organize and to inspire and activate the community. So as that was happening, I started seeing cities around the country appoint a poet laureate. And I'm like, it would be so cool to see our city take that same approach, you know, and really use their positions to put some backing behind this art because it's it's storytelling. You know, it's our tradition. This is what we do as a, as a people. Um, so I started to go to council members and ask, like, would you be interested in, in backing this? And finally, um, the Maston District Council Member um, Ulysses Wingo, um, he was like, yeah, let's do it. So for a couple of years, I learned how to write resolutions <laughs> <laughs> and I worked with um, his staff and we just did all this work to establish this role. And finally he 
brought it to the Common Council and they voted to establish the role and to make me the first. Okay, so and so that's interesting. So they, they established the role to make you the first, but moving forward, it's going to work, as, as I understand it, it's going to work differently. It's not just going to be one person who's just appointed, let's say, by a Common Council resolution, right? Well, there always will be a Common Council okay. resolution, um, and there, the understanding was always that I'm just the first, okay. not that I'd be the only. So we wrote it in so that each Poet Laureate has a, a term limit. Um, I know we're a city that often likes to function without them, but <laughs> I thought <laughs> there was some benefit to them. Um, so it's a two-year term, so every two years we should expect to see a new Poet Laureate. I'm not sure right now what that process looks like from the city's point of view. And I'm hoping that over the next couple of years, I can collaborate with the city to kind of make sure that the vision for this being a community role where the people are really um, in touch with who gets selected to represent them on this platform, um, we can make it more along the line of that kind of process. Right. Maybe a community um, council where we know who the members are and um, anonymous submissions so that poets, regardless of what size platform they already have, have a chance to say, hey, look at my work. I can do this too. I think about my own journey and a lot of writers, they get started in academia or they go into the slam poetry community and I didn't get started that way you know I was at protests and at vigils and at memorial services of people who I never met just trying to spark something in the community so my platform was not big in the way some other writers are I wasn't known in that community they had no idea who I was now the community you know people who live on the east side they started to get an idea, but we all enter this in a different way. So I think coming up with a public process, a transparent process where people who have a love for this art, regardless of how they got there, can all get an equal shot at being able to stand on this platform is necessary. So I'm hoping that I can collaborate with the city or at least just express some of my own ideas for how this can happen in the future. Um, so we can make sure that everybody has an understanding of how this is going. Right. So it, it, we can understand how there might be maybe we'll use the kindly use the word confusion about how we were going to move forward with this because it it was a unique development a couple of years ago to have you as yeah. as uh, as the poet laureate. Let's maybe just talk in an ideal world. I know there was a, mm-hmm. a, a resolution passed in December. If I read it and understood it vaguely, that this next position, next laureate might be appointed by the mayor. But mm-hmm. we'll leave that aside for now. But if you were going to just say how it should develop and how perhaps people should come to the table for this, how would you like to see it done? Well, I think first we have to start at, and look at what we want this role to be. Right. Like, do we want this to continue to be someone who is active in serving the community? Um, If that's the case, then the community has to take the reins on deciding who it is. Ideally, I would take someone from the art community and someone from the literary community and a few people from, you know, maybe organizations or just community groups. They don't even have to be 501c3s, you know, active community groups, um, maybe a youth, a member of our city's youth. They sit on a council and members of the community who want to be poet laureate, who say, I have what it takes to lead in this way, they'll submit. They'll submit some writing, maybe an essay, um, or just something to really show their passion for this community anonymously. And the commission, they would read these submissions and debate them and talk about them and keeping keeping in mind who we want this person to be, what we want them to represent for our community. And then they would make the recommendation to the mayor if he wants to be the one to appoint. I will never, you know, debate that, but they would make the recommendation to the mayor for him to appoint someone based off of that search. What about the, the, let's turn it then to the person who, thinks they want it to be Poet Laureate. We'll put it that way, thanks, because you never know it until you do it, and you <laughs> yeah. most certainly know about the experience and how it, your role has changed for sure here. But what about that person, do you think, 
who wants to be that poet laureate for mm-hmm. Buffalo, what what should be or you know I don't necessarily I don't think we have to talk I don't think you necessarily want to narrow down subject matter yeah no. but but in terms of approach and maybe mm-hmm. just a, a general uh, philosophy perhaps about poetry and about this community as well. Yeah, I think they just have to have a heart for the people and they have to have the selflessness to understand that a lot of times you are going to be representing people who don't look like you or helping people through something that nobody has ever experienced in your in proximity to you. Um, a lot of times you have to put your own feelings to the side in order to lead. Um, I know some people are like, it's, you're just... It's just poetry. Like mm. you just write poems and you get a platform and you get to work with the bills <laughs> and you get to go on the radio. But no, you have to really stand for something and you have to be about that. There are so many times that I do interviews like this and people email me or they message me on my website and they're just like, I'm so inspired by what you said. I'm so inspired by what you do. And for every five people who send me that email, I get another one that's like, who do you think you are? (laughs) Mm. You have to understand that it's not about you. So none of that matters. Um, The awards, they're beautiful, but they don't matter in the grand scope of things. Because whatever it is that you are trying to inspire the community to do, everyone won't be an activist, right? (laughs) Um, But whatever it is that you are, whatever... The platform is that you're standing on. The thing that you believe in is you have to be willing to stand on that regardless. Even when you get tired or it gets hard or you're balancing being the poet laureate with having your regular job or being in school or whatever it is that you do, um, you have to keep you have to keep going. So I think as long as the person who thinks I can be the poet laureate, they're going into it thinking I can really serve this community. I really have something to say that I think will push us forward. Then I think go for it. But if your mindset is, I want to make videos with the Sabres and I want to stand out amongst my community of poets, don't do it. <laughs> you're, you're not ready. It's not time. Right, right. Yeah. That's a, that's a great way uh, to to look at it. Jillian Hainsworth, our guest, and uh, as you may have heard at the at the top, uh, the former uh, poet laureate for the city of Buffalo. Her term uh, has expired, and uh, we're uh, looking forward to uh, perhaps who will be the the next uh, poet laureate. What about uh, during your time as this? Mm-hmm. Have poets come out of the woodwork and found you? I yeah. bet they have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, Sometimes they're just like, I, I love what you do. Like, you're so good. Um, let's collaborate. But sometimes they're like, I, I need you to prove it. Prove yourself to me. <laughs> I've had a lot of poets who have come to me like, listen, I had no idea who you were. So I'm glad that it was you ultimately. But I was very hesitant when I first heard your name because I didn't know you. And I get it. Um, I don't feel like... Again, it's my role to prove myself to people right? because that's pride, you know, and again, it's not about me. So I'm just like, you know, I'm I'm saying what's on my heart and what I really do believe my community needs to hear. But I have had quite a few poets just like when we first heard you were going to be the poet laureate, we were like, who is this girl? Like, who are you? And we were hesitant. We were doubtful. But over time you've you've shown us who you are what uh like you said it's not about proving yourself it's not about you it doesn't Mm -hmm. it can't be about the individual at the same time what do you think won over the the doubters i guess uh if i'll put Um, them in that category honestly i think it's just because i write good have good work like the poet the poems are good um and i think it's also just the way that they see i'm able to connect with the people that i'm performing for um and that I really do believe the things that I write about. Like if I have a poem or a line in a poem about something like political, like you can believe that that is a thousand percent <laughs> how I actually feel. Okay. Um, the concepts in the poem about, you know, the poems that I that I have had that the community really kind of gravitated to about like love and, and power, 
that's truly truly what I believe so I think the fact that I stand on what it is I say they're like okay she's honest authentic and a good writer so we'll we'll, we'll rock with her Jillian Hainsworth the first Buffalo Poet Laureate with us on What's Next. Jillian, as always, thank you so much. Thanks for having me.